face this morning. What a beautiful day the Lord has made. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. I'm excited for today's service. Now, I know last week I came down off the pulpit and I was like, okay, I'm a little embarrassed. I made like 14 clerical errors in my bulletin. I think I fixed those. I think we're good now. So this Wednesday, March 2nd, we will be in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 1 through 14. It will be from 7 to 8 and I have that in there. So we're good. Um, next Sunday, March 6th, so a week from today, week from today already, we have our annual shrimp boil. Now, if you didn't bring all the food that needs to be prepared that you signed up for, you can bring that today. We'll be here for youth group tonight at 6 o'clock. So if you need to bring it tonight, just make sure we get that so we have all that prepared. But it's going to be $5 per person uh, for those that are four and older. Proceeds are going to go to the youth group, and so we're real excited about that. Uh, but, yeah, come next week, prepare to stay after, and we're going to have some food afterwards. And then March 10th, uh, we're going to be going to Lake Aurora Christian Academy. Um, it's a camp. It's, it's an awesome, awesome place. I, I've been there. I've visited it. I'm excited to go with you all. We're going to have our Young at Heart event. It's for anybody that's 60 and older. Um, we have a ton of people that have already signed up. If you have yet to sign up, please sign up. We'd love to have you. Um, I'm going to be going. Uh, I think it's going to be a wonderful time. Boat ride, Christian speaker, uh, just an entire day uh, mapped out for y'all. There is one condition, and I need some help with this. Last I checked, there was 25 people Ooh. signed up. All right. Which means our church van only holds 12. My ma I'm not the best at math, but I need about 13 seats. Now, I do have a couple <laughs> people that have volunteered uh, to, to uh, take a few people, but if you are willing, thank you, thank you, Bob. Um, if you are willing to possibly be a, a driver, take a couple people with you, I would greatly appreciate. See me, give me a text, give me a call, talk to me after church. That way we can make sure that every single person gets there that wants to go. All right. Well, I'm ready for the service. I'm ready for the worship. Let's All right. Go Amen. I was just doing that to mess with them. I mean, no, we, <laughs> yeah. It's a new gospel hymn we wrote. Let's everybody stand up. We're going to sing. Are you washed in the blood? Now, I promise we will not banjo you every Sunday, but this is just a little something different today. And, Tony, don't teach my guitar any bad habits, all right? <laughs> oh, no. All right, here we go. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you only trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless, are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? 
because we're getting ready to fly away, okay? All right, here we go. Here we go. Well, some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home when God's celestial shore
can pay God for this. I mean, you can't pay God for this. And then I'm going to read you some scriptures. Oh, yeah, we're going to have scriptures. I don't do nothing without scriptures. Malachi 3, 10, and 11. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. Prove me now, hear the say of the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out the blessings that shall not be room enough to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. He shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine or your cast her fruit before his time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And that is Malachi 3, 10, 11. Also, John 10, 11, it says, The thief cometh not but to steal and kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have more abundantly. And 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Every man according as he is purposed in his heart shall let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. And so the thing we learn here is we've got to be a cheerful giver. At one time I was not. The Lord taught me that. And this was one incident really taught me. I was raised in a Baptist church. I tithed. I believed in tithing. But when it comes down to my, my bills get paid or tithing, I was ready to forget the tithing. We can't do that. Me and my wife, we've seen things happen through tithing. Just wouldn't believe it. So that's where we are as far as tithing, I think. We always talk about the blessings, but we need to think about the protection the Lord gives us over the devourer. And can we pray now? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for all you've done for us, that you died on the cross for us, saved us from our sins, gave us an eternal life. I thank you for this worship body, Lord. I thank you that people are coming out to hear your word. And Lord, I pray that you bless all the offerings and all the tithes that are put in the offering plate today. And Lord, may it go for good needs for the church and for the community. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Bye.
time this morning uh, I'd like to say on behalf as a board member and as a member of the congregation that the last couple of weeks here have been very exciting the number of people we've had at the church the fact that the fellowship hall has been put back into service there's people in there having coffee and a donut and talking and chatting we had the men and women's meetings in the fellowship hall the life and the energy that's coming back into the church is just absolutely amazing it's a wonderful sight to see and behold and god gets all the credit for that um ironically it was two years ago if we all remember that the pandemic broke early march at least in our country and things just totally went crazy and we were going to have that shrimp boil in 20 march of 2020 we were one week from it when it broke and we did not have the shrimp boil in 2020 because of the breaking of the pandemic. And so the last one was 2019. Anthony said our annual shrimp boil. I got thinking about it. Yeah, it's supposed to be annual, but we've missed that for a couple of years. And that's now returning in 2022. So again, it's just signs of life coming back to the church. Maybe things are starting to return to normal. And man, I, just, I love to see it. It's great. Uh, let us go to prayer. Father, we are grateful today. Uh, we're grateful for the blood of your son that uh, cleanses our hearts. Uh, we are forgiven for our past transgressions, our current, our future. Your word says if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us. And so daily I would encourage each one of us to come before you uh, in the morning. We would ask that you would set a guard on our mouths as we go into the day. Uh, help us to speak right words, uh, building words up lifting words, things that edify and help other people to draw closer to you, and at the close of the day, help us to search our hearts. Uh, may we look at our lives and what we did on a daily basis and just ask you to forgive us if we hurt someone else or if we acted in a way that was like unbecoming to you. Uh, just daily help us to be who you would want us to be. Your word tells us to be uh, doers of the word and not hearers only. Help us to be in practice what we are in position uh, as children of yours. Uh, may it was just daily help us to be holy. Uh, it's an aspect of the Christian life that we don't uh, like to hear about because it steps on our toes, uh, makes us feel uncomfortable. We realize that we don't always measure up, but yet that's what you expect of us. You want us to be holy because you are holy, and we are to be a reflection of your son. And I would just encourage us all to think about that as we go into this week. And again, we do. We thank you for your faithfulness over the last couple of years. It's been a difficult couple of years. You've promised to be faithful in the storms and in the floods, and we've all faced those at various times in the past couple of years for a uh, multitude of different reasons, and yet you've been there with us. Uh, you are so good. Your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for uh, the promises that you've given in your word to be there for us stand on those this morning uh, we thank you for pastor anthony and his family for his leadership and we just look forward to what you have here for our congregation moving ahead and we just commit this service to you this morning uh, 
Give us open hearts. May the anointing of your spirit be upon Anthony and upon the words he has for us. Amen. We love you and we praise you this morning. In Christ's name. Amen. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Now, I'm going to kind of just start off here. Um, I don't know about you. I mean, I, I, I want to kind of piggyback off of his prayer. Um, man, there's been a lot of energy in here the last few weeks, hasn't there? You know, that worship set this morning, thanks, thank you to all of you. I mean, I could hear the voices bouncing off uh, of the ceiling. And, you know, at first I was like, well, maybe there's just a lot of people up there with microphones. And then I got to looking around and everybody's singing and you saw everybody's heart being poured out. That was beautiful. When you get a body of believers that are there to, you know what, whether this is my favorite song or not, whether this is my style of music, hymn, contemporary, whatever it may be, but I just want to worship God right now, then you get what you saw. That was beautiful, and so that was a wonderful way to set up the service this morning, and I'm excited. Maybe I'm also excited, and I'm going to put, throw them on the spot there. I got my mom and brother here this morning, um, so they traveled down there in the middle there. Um, so I'm excited about that, got to spend the day with them. If you haven't had a chance to meet them or say hi, talk to them, embarrass them a little bit. I'm all right with that. So, but no, I, I'm excited this morning. Uh, we are in the last week uh, of this mini sermon series that we've been doing, uh, Doubting versus Believing. What will you do? And so, you know, I'm excited to kind of finalize this. And we've had some really, really good arguments and discussions as to why we believe the way we do. We've talked about um, these different scientific reasons about why we believe the way we do. Uh, we've talked about hell and how uncomfortable it can make some people. And, you know, we've just, we, we've had these discussions that I think are going to really excite and ignite us as we go out and be the body of Christ to this community. Amen? Now, today is the last Sunday before we begin our Lenten season. Now, to some of you, that doesn't mean a lot. But over the period of the next few weeks, we are going to talk about Lent. We're going to talk about what it means. We're going to talk about some of the things that you can do. Um, I know that's not, you know, necessarily a Church of God thing. It's not necessarily, um, you know, certain denominational thing. But there is a huge, huge benefit to what we can do in our walk with Christ during the Lenten season. But that is for next week. Uh, we do have one final sermon today. And this one's entitled, M. I a disciple you know this is something that I've stressed something that I've harped on a whole lot since I've been here so as I prepare you to 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 go out and, and make disciples you might be asking yourself well what is a disciple I've listened I've thought about it or, or what does a disciple do maybe even asking how do we make new disciples what do I say and if you recall a passage of scripture I've talked about quite a bit since I've arrived and even posted about on Facebook for those of you that follow me this week is Matthew chapter 28 it's verses 19 and 20 so I'll give you a chance I know I'm trying to get in the habit if you want to turn go ahead and open your Bibles pull out your electronic devices or if you like the big screen behind me that will also have it this morning so Matthew chapter 28 verses 19 through 20 which says this then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, with you, commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now these two passages of Scripture, they seem to be lost around the country these days we no longer want to, to make disciples as much as we want to build mega-sized country clubs mega-sized country clubs but if you read the scriptures and i really i mean really read the verses as they are written as what the bible is commanding us then you would see that after accepting christ which i think many of us have if you have not accepted christ come and see me we will talk we will we will have a few discussions about how we can make that happen if that's something you want to do but after you've accepted christ as your lord and savior that next step is to really embark on making disciples now yes you're new in your faith 
you don't, you know, understand a lot of scripture necessarily, but that is what you're called to do. Now, that doesn't mean for those of you that have accepted Christ that your journey just ends there. Okay, I've got to go talk to people. No, 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 no. You, myself included, we are going to learn more and more each day during the process. I would love to tell you that just because I pastor, just because I stand up here and preach on Sunday, that I know everything that the Bible has to offer, and I am a perfect human being. But that is not the case. I am still learning every day how to be a better husband, how to be a better father, how to love Jesus Christ more. Amen? <clears throat> but it doesn't negate the fact that we are to be shouting Jesus at the top of our lungs for the whole world to hear. Do you remember when you first came to Christ, how excited you were? Do you remember when you first understood who he is and what he did for you, how you had to just run out and tell the world about him? I, I do. It's been about 10 years ago. September of this year will be 10 years since I gave my life to the Lord. And I'm excited about that. There's times where I think about, man, I could have done so much more, but I, I am excited for what's in front of me. I'm excited for what the Lord has for me, what he has for this church, what he has in store for every single one of you that call upon his name. <clears throat> but somewhere along the way, not necessarily just this church, not just this town, not just this country, Somewhere along the way, we lost interest in sharing the good news with others. We became more consumed with football scores, hobbies, and weather than we did about Christ. When I was a restaurant manager, I would talk to people, and I'd try and strum up that conversation. I'd be like, okay, I'd pray before I'd walk in each morning, and I'd say, Lord, if there's, there's somebody here that I can impact— then open that door. And there were times that he did, and we talked for a few minutes, but more often than not, when I would spark that conversation, it would go, well, did you see the Browns game yesterday? Or did you, did you see the baseball game? Or did you see this new television show that's out? And it quickly turned into that. And in our jobs, at our schools, in our communities where we live, you constantly have people that are quick to jump that ship. Okay, you can like Jesus, but I don't know if you should love him. I don't know if you should be obsessed, so to speak, with him. Talk about him a little bit, say his name, and then move on about your day. <clears throat> when Jesus spoke these words to his followers some 2,000 years ago, these words were meant to carry the test of time. They were meant to carry the test of time. It still applies to us today. The same way it did to them not so long ago. When Jesus says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, I have news for you. He's not asking you to do that. He's commanding us to do it. He's giving us a direct order, an order we as Christians are supposed to be following to go and make disciples of all nations however we seem to miss where it says plain as day again to go and make disciples now on a side note in this verse you also see jesus say baptize let's talk about that for a minute i love baptisms it's something we have yet to do actually if i'm not mistaken i'm standing on an area where i can baptize people there you go so, he led right into it. If anyone in here wants to be baptized, come see me. Come talk to me. Don't wait another day. We can make that happen. But I also want to clarify something. With that being said, there are certain religions that teach baptizing is necessary for salvation. While I will stress, as your pastor, baptizing, being baptized is something you should aspire to do and something you should want to do, to declare your faith to the world. It is not something that is necessary for salvation. Being baptized does not ensure you will go to heaven. I know there are many religions that teach that, 
Maybe even some of you have heard that. But nowhere in the Bible does it say being baptized is required for salvation. So let's just put that elephant out in the room. Let's talk about it for a minute. It's very important in your steps of obedience to Christ to be baptized. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. So if it is something that you want to do, come and see me. Well, pastor said I don't have to do it to be saved or I don't have to do it to go to heaven. I guess that means, no, no, no. You want to make that public declaration. It's something you should do, that you should want to do. And I promise you, if you are in communication with Christ daily and you have yet to have that happen, he's going to lay it on your heart to have that happen. But I just wanted you to know, it can be a big point of contention in other religions, denominations. So I wanted to clear that up first, since it was addressed in the passages today. But do you know what is required to be saved? Here come the requirements. What is required is to to begin the process of becoming a disciple. And what do I mean by that? First, we must believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he came to earth to die for our sins. Amen? Second, we must accept him as Lord and Savior over our life. And third, after we do that, we must repent of our sins. There you go. I just gave you the roadmap, the literally your GPS to salvation. That's it. But, does anyone in here, and I want to talk about this for a minute, the elephant in the room, does anybody know what the word repent means this morning? Okay, okay. Yeah, it's not a verb you hear much in the church anymore. You don't hear it used. You definitely don't hear it out of the prosperity gospels that you hear on on TV and those pastors that that are saying that. Now, I'm going to read this from another source. I did not write this, I pulled this, but it says repentance, properly defined, is necessary for salvation. Biblical repentance is changing your mind about sin. No longer is sin something to mess around with. It is something to be forsaken. It is changing our mind about Jesus Christ. No longer is he to be mocked, discounted, or ignored in our lives. He is the Savior to be clung to. He is the Lord to be worshipped and adored. Amen? Now, I began by asking you what a disciple is. Now, we need to understand that as, as we ask ourselves, if we are indeed a disciple, what does that mean? Process that. Because if we are not a disciple ourselves, then in no way, shape, or form can we go and begin to make disciples. So many times in the church, we get caught up calling ourselves Christians. Do you know how many times, again, in the restaurant, I use this analogy, because for those of you that have worked in, these are the two that I know of, the medical field or the restaurant. For those of you that know that, there's a lot of interesting things that take place. That's the word I'll use, interesting things. And a lot of times when you talk about your faith to people, they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian, but you know them outside of work. You know them on their Facebook. You know them in their life outside of that building. And their life does not scream Christ. So really, they have to ask themselves, am I a Christian? Am I a disciple? But I want to be very, very clear, and this may stir the pot a little bit. Being a Christian is not what you should strive to be. Being a disciple who makes disciples is what you should strive to be. You see, this world, it has a magnifying glass on your life. Your friends, your family, your co-workers. So every time you make that funny Facebook post, which isn't isn't that offensive, just a little offensive, maybe it's got one word in there. Every time you do that, somebody's watching. Every time you make that joke at the water cooler at work, it's not that bad. It only has one cuss word in it. The world is watching. Every time you post about a television show, a movie, or something that you witnessed or thought was okay to watch, the world is watching. It's waiting. It's waiting to sit there and go, oh, well, wait, you you claim to be a Christian. That television show is not very Christian. Or wait, 
You know, I, I read what you posted on Facebook. I don't think Jesus would post that, would he? They're waiting. We are to be a light, a light, a beacon for the world. Christ should be shining through us like the sun. Ah, Wordplay there, S-O-N-S-U-N, right? It should be signing, it should be shining through us. And it should be so exciting. We should be so pumped up about it, but the world can't help but take notice. But oftentimes we get lost in the world, don't we? And I'm not here to criticize. I'm not here as your pastor to judge you and say this. I'm here to help redirect our motivation, to redirect our path and put us back on course. Brothers and sisters, what do we really want to be known as? Does anybody remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17? He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Jesus knew. He knew that before we could follow him, that they would need to repent of our sins, that we would need to repent of our sins. So as disciples, we must do the same thing. If we have sins that are unrepentant, then we must repent of them and move forward. I will never forget. Even after I came to the Lord, I laid it all at the altar, there was just this one sin, this one sin that I was holding on to. He can't forgive me for that. That one's too deep. It hurts too much. He can't forgive me for that. Then I finally got a good pastor around me, you know, a good mentor, and he started talking to me. He said, oh, I, he has forgiven you. He paid the price on the cross for you. You don't have to carry those burdens like cinder blocks on your shoulders anymore. And it was literally like those cinder blocks were just lifted off. So if there's any of you in here this morning that have a sin that you think you cannot be forgiven for, you can be forgiven. Take that to God. Ask for his forgiveness, and I can promise you, you will be forgiven. But after repentance, after that, what happens next? Well, let's take a look at when Jesus called his first disciples into action. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20. It says, As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. So what is Jesus saying here? What am I saying here? What is this sermon all about? He's telling these men to follow him, and he will make them fishers of men. When Jesus called his disciples into action, they didn't show up on Sunday mornings to hear Jesus preach. While I like an audience, the selfish human, the human inside of me, I like an audience. I like for people to listen to me talk. I liked it before I was a pastor. So I love when people show up. If nothing happens when you walk outside of these walls, then I failed. I have failed as a pastor if I'm not equipping you to be fishers of men. These disciples, they were with Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week for three years. Now, if you come to my house and try and do that, that might be a little rough. I got kids, I got a wife, I got some things I can do, but I can promise you to come alongside you, to walk with you, to lock arm in arm with you, to hold your hand, to help you understand who God is better so I can equip you better to go and make disciples. That is why I am here. And that's where every single one of us in here that know Jesus, that's what we're supposed to be. We are followers of Jesus called to do what he did. Each and every week that we come here, that we come to Wednesday nights, that we come to the men's and women's meetings, we should be equipping ourselves to become fishers of men. Each and every day, 
we should be asking ourselves if we are following Jesus to the best of our ability. And I'll admit, I still slip and fall. There's times I'm not doing what I should be doing. And I don't mean that as I'm running away in sin type thing, but I'm not utilizing my time to the best of my ability. There is nothing about our faith as Christians, as disciples, that should be lukewarm. Our faith should be a red hot fire, and those coals should burn within us daily. It should motivate us to get through this thing called life. And again, the worst part is the majority of people sitting in churches all across the nation today are not disciples. They're simply what I like to call fans, hoping to get into the gates of heaven one day. But I can promise you, again, giving you that GPS, that roadmap, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he did come to earth to live his life and to die for you, if you repent of your sins, if you declare him Lord and Savior of your life, everything will change. And when everything changes, you can't help but be red hot. And sometimes we need a reminder. Those of us that have been Christians, those of us that have been followers for 10 years, 20 years, sometimes we need a kick in the pants to get going again, and that's okay. My coffee gets me going in the morning. Sometimes I need Christ to give me that kick to go again. I need him each and every day. And when I say sometimes I need him, I mean all the time I need him. I have to put my faith and my trust in him alone in this world. In Luke chapter 14, verses 26 and 27, it says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Kind of interesting, I bring up that verse here with my family here. Did I plan that? Did it work that way? No, I was already doing this sermon. Church, you see the word disciple in these last two verses, it's used twice. But what really is a disciple? A disciple is someone who has a desire to learn. Someone who wants to be a student and further their education when it comes to the word of God and what he's trying to teach us. You see, just because we've repented and given our lives to Christ, it doesn't mean we don't have more to learn. We as followers, we must want to learn daily. Not afraid to repent when we we stumble. To be studious when it comes to the word. Don't be afraid to ask the hard questions when you're confused. Go to your pastor. Go to your Sunday school teacher. Or even the elders in the church. They are in those positions to help you understand better. If something comes across in your daily reading, man, I'd really like, oh, I can't bother the pastor. He's too busy. There's a reason all my contact info is back there. I'm never too busy to talk about the word of God with my people. Those of you here this morning and listening online, we have a choice. We have a choice. You can be a casual fan of Jesus and listen to sermons and show up to church and tell people you believe in Christ. Or you can be a devout follower, a disciple of Christ, who lives and breathes the scriptures. One who exemplifies who Jesus is by the way they live their life, by the way they show their love to others. One who talks to others about Christ and how they handle those life situations. We've had things happen in the last two or three months in this church that have tried to rock the foundation to the core. You see the amount of people sitting here? Do you see the people coming each week, praying, reading, learning? The gates of heaven are shaking. It's excited. Everybody in here is motivated. We want to know the Lord better. We want to be a beacon in this community. When you do this 
And what I mean by this is church. When you do church the biblical way, the right way, and to back up on CJ's point, or look at the life in this church. This isn't going to stop. This isn't some fad. This is a movement. This is the church of God. This is who we are. And you can't take that away from us. No matter what happens around the world, around the country, whatever laws are put into place, we are followers of Christ. We answer to nobody except God alone. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, as the worship team comes forward this morning, I just felt the need to pray this morning to end the sermon. God, this is a lot of heavy information. It's easy to be a casual fan. It's easy to just go to church on Sunday and say, okay, I've done my part in my walk with God, Lord, but I know the people sitting in here want more. I know we as a church, we hunger for more. We want to know your word inside and out. We want to be a beacon of light in this community. We want Winter Haven to understand there is a God and he is for us. So Lord, as we play the last song this morning, let us lift our voices on high to you. Let us sing an adoration of what you've done and just who you are and how much we love you, Lord. Lord, be with us the rest of the day. Help us to focus and help those naysayers that look at us and say, oh, no, no, no. They're not a Christian. Help us to reevaluate where we are and show exactly who you are. Let us live by your example, Lord. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this morning's service and the impact that it's going to have. I can't thank you enough, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to end on a good old invitational song. And the altar is always open, as Pastor says. And, um, you know, that song, You are my friend, you are my brother, even though you are a king. When I get to that line and that As the Deer song, it always kind of just breaks me. <laughs> this song talks about molding us like a potter and a, how we get smushed into a new thing when we're saved. You know, God makes us all new. If you haven't had that experience yet, place to come. Discipling is not hard either, by the way, for those of you who've been around a while. Sometimes it's just a simple word or two, just a phrase of somebody that changed their whole life. So you just got to be willing to put the time into it. All right. Stand with us this morning, please, if you would. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own
Christ only always living in me. That's what I picked up from that. As you leave this morning, you have a choice. You can go back to just casual Sunday living. I'll show up to church. I'll go out to lunch with the family, and that's it. Or we here at Spirit Lake, we can be something different. We can be obsessed, and I'm going to use that word in the right way, obsessed with who our Lord is. Look at all that he's done in your life. Understand that what he's about to do in your life, even whatever stage you're in, and what he's about to do in the life of this church, I can't begin to put words into, but I can feel it. Amen. What I felt in the singing again as we closed is too beautiful for me, for me to put into words. So think about that this week. Wherever you are in your walk, take that next step. Amen? Amen. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you. Lord, I thank you for every man, woman, and child here this morning. Lord, I, I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit during the sermon, during the worship, Lord, even as we were filing in today, Lord. Lord, we are going to do big things here. And when we do these big things, Spirit Lake's not getting the credit. Anthony's not getting the credit. No, only God alone is going to get the credit. Everything we do, Lord, we do to glorify you. I pray for that anointment from on high for this church for each individual in their time studying the word and getting to know you more, God. We want to do big things, and we ask you to guide us. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, all right, we're going to give you a little walking out music so you can carry this bounce and this question out into the world. Amen. Amen. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb?